Hi, everybody. Uh, we are going to continue with part three of the skeletal system. Uh, and we're going to start discussing the epiphyseal growth, uh, which basically happens uh, during the childhood, allowing the child's uh, bones to grow and develop properly. Uh, please do note that the growth of the bone, uh, the proper growth of the bone relies heavily on enzymes such as growth hormone, as well as the presence of certain vitamins that ensure the absorption of the nutrients and um, uh, hardening of the bone tissue. So let's go ahead and get started with epiphyseal plate. Uh, epiphyseal plate uh, is again located between the epiphysis and diaphysis. It is made up of hyaline cartilage, which we discussed earlier, and, um, and basically it is important in terms of the growth of the child. So to kind of depicting what we have here, uh, so they're showing you the epiphyseal plate here. Uh, so imagine again, kind of your bone is the epiphysis is up here. Here is what we're showing here would be part of the diaphysis and then going down and then you will have the epiphysis, the other epiphysis on that side. So within this, uh, what you will have uh, is you have what we identified as the resting zone. Uh, resting zone is basically cartilage cells that are not involved in a process and they're, they're not undergoing any changes. Right underneath that, you have what we identify as growth or proliferation zone, uh, which is basically the location where the cartilage cells are actively undergoing cell division to um, uh, basically create new cartilages, cartilage tissue. I'm not gonna talk about the hypertrophic zone uh, for this purpose. Um, uh, I, I'm not really gonna focus on the, class, the calcification zone, but I do wanna talk about the ossification zone. Uh, the goal here is for you to understand that um, you don't directly go cartilage to uh, bone. Uh, there is changes that happens in a cartilage Basically, the cartilage gets really work really hard, uh, which causes the calcification to take place. And as this calcification happens, uh, then the cells, the chondrocytes, get disconnected from uh, the nutrient source and the um, oxygen, and these cells die. And as they die, they call the um, uh, deterioration of the cartilage tissue and that transfers into uh, a perfect location for bone cells to come into play and converts that degrading cartilage tissue into bony tissue. Now, how much of that information do you really need to know for the exam is these two lines. So you need to know the growth and proliferation zone or, and the ossification zone. So the way I always tell my students to think about this is think about you have a container, okay? Um, this container have an opening on the bottom and it has, an op has a way for you to add material from the top. Now, what you're adding on the top is new cartilage, which is basically from the epiphysis end, from the epiphysis. And what comes out from the diaphysis and is basically the process of ossification, which is when you're converting your bony tissue to cartilage. Now, under normal condition, what you want to have is as the child is growing, you want the level of the cartilage added. So let's say I arbitrary numbers, I'm adding 300 units of cartilage on the top, I want to remove 300 of the old cartilage cells and replace them with um, bone cells. Again, these are arbitrary numbers. This is not how it's happening, but I want you guys to get an idea. So if you are healthy and growing properly, the rate of the cartilage division is equal to the rate of ossification from the diaphysis end. That implies that the length of the um, epiphyseal plate remains the same, which is basically the thickness or the amount of this, which is, so what this is, this 
area right here for us. This is your epiphyseal what? Epiphyseal. Sorry for the writing, my pen is not working very well. The epiphyseal plate is basically um, the area of the cartilage where you add in cartilage on the top and then it gets converted to bony tissue from the bottom. If the person is growing properly, the rate of the cell division for the cartilage is equal to the ossification rate, which means the epiphyseal plate remains the same size. Now, um, when you are thinking about um, uh, as the adolescent, uh, um, as the person reaches adolescence, uh, there is a typically increase in the main two sex hormones, which is estrogen or testosterone, depending on the gender. As these levels increase, uh, it is a marking for the beginning of the end, as in the person is going to uh, slowly start to decrease in the um, activity of the um, chondroblast, and that eventually leads to a slowing down the, uh, the growth and eventually stopping it. So how does a person that is undergoing growth eventually stops uh, as they reach adulthood? This is what happens. So chondroblast division slows down at the epiphyseal end. So basically going back to our picture here, let's say you drop the rate to about 100. However, the osteoblast uh, that overtake the cartilage from the diaphysis side. So the rate of the ossification on the other end remains the same. So you slow down adding from the top, but the rate of the ossification on the bottom remains the same. When that takes place, the plate becomes thinner and thinner until you have a very thin line uh, representing the uh, resting zone of the cartilage and at that point, this is not called a plate anymore, and this is referred to as the epiphyseal line. So understand again, during childhood, the rate of the osteoblast formation is, uh, sorry, not osteoblast, chondrocyte division is equal to the uh, ossification rate. So your um, epiphyseal plate length remains the same. As you reach maturity, the levels of testosterone and estrogen it slows down the division of the uh, chondrocytes. However, it, the osteoossification process continues at the same rate. That triggers the uh, epiphyseal plate to get smaller and smaller and eventually becomes pretty a uh, thin line, uh, which we identify as epiphyseal line. It's also known as the plate closure. So here in this picture right here, you can clearly see that the epiphysis and diaphysis are separated from each other. Uh, so that means that's the cartilages, cartilaginous tissue. Now, if you compare this to an adult bone, this line will not be visible because the epiphyseal plate uh, has uh, been changed to epiphyseal line uh, through the process of the uh, plate closure. So that separation will not be clear, as you can kind of see on the top picture. Uh, you can really say where the epiphysis uh, uh, starts and where the diaphysis starts. Now, in terms of uh, the hormonal effect, uh, in terms of bone growth, uh, the two, there's a few hormones that are extremely important during the process. One, which is very logical, is growth hormone. So growth hormone uh, is released by anterior pituitary gland, and uh, it is important in terms of making sure that the process of uh, ossification uh, and um, chondral site formation uh, happens properly, allowing the bone to continue growing. Uh, another hormone that has an effect is parathyroid hormone. Um, parathyroid hormone, which we also talked about earlier, also described or shortened to PTH, uh, is released from the parathyroid gland, you know, which is depicted right here as these orange dots. And the parathyroid glands are going to allow the activity of the osteoblast to decline and it uh, excites or um, increase the activity of the osteoclast. 
a reminder, osteoblast activity declining means that you have less bone deposition uh, as in you are adding less calcium or phosphate into your bone. An increasing osteoclast activity implies that you are uh, breaking down more bone and releasing the calcium and phosphate into your bloodstream. Opposite of parathyroid is a hormone called calcitonin being released from your thyroid gland, which is the butterfly-shaped gland you'll see, uh, you see on the picture right here. So that's the thyroid gland. Uh, thyroid gland is um, uh, releasing the hormone calcitonin uh, in scenarios where you have uh, too much calcium in your bloodstream. So your body's idea is if I have too much calcium, I'm going to take that calcium and uh, store it inside my bony tissue uh, for later use. Uh, therefore, it increases the osteoblast activity and therefore increasing the bone deposition. Again, allowing more bone to be deposited. Uh, testosterone, uh, which is basically the sex hormone, uh, starts to release during um, puberty. And uh, like estrogen, it marks the beginning of the end, uh, which uh, slows down the activity of the osteoblast in the uh, epiphyseal plate and mark the beginning of the end of the bone growth. Vitamin A and C are both important in terms of promoting bone matrix and vitamin D, uh, which should always be supplemented if you're taking calcium as a supplement, uh, is necessary for absorption of the calcium during the passage uh, through a small intestine. So please, please do note that if the uh, vitamin D is not added to um, calcium supplement, mm, a lot of that calcium will not be absorbed into the system. So um, this concept, when we're talking about blood calcium level and some of the effects, uh, you can have scenarios like hypocalcemia, which basically means low levels of calcium, uh, which may cause hyperexcitability of cells like your neuron cells, your uh, brain cells, which is the neurons, um, your cardiac cells and the skeletal muscle. It can cause uh, high levels of calcium called hypercalcemia, and that can also cause uh, non-responsiveness in the uh, main systems of cells like neurons, cardiovascular nerve, sorry, cardiac cells, and uh, skeletal muscle cells. Um, if you have high levels of calcium in your blood, uh, it can also deposit those extra calcium inside the kidneys and blood vessels and um, if it causes if it's stored in the blood vessels it causes the degradation of the blood vessels and if they are stored inside the um, they are present in kidneys they can lead to development of kidney stones um, hence anytime we're talking about uh, chemis chemistry or chemical aspect of the blood you must have homeostasis too much or too little of it is never good for your body. And either extreme is going to have negative effects in your body. Now, the last concept I'm going to talk to you guys about for this PowerPoint is bone remodeling. So bone remodeling is basically respond, response, responsiveness of your bone into, in terms of mechanical stress. Uh, this is based on what we identify as wolf law, uh, which says basically uh, the bone can grow and remodel itself based on the demands that is placed on it. Uh, so uh, if you place a stress on the bone um, over and over again, that actually causes the bone to become stronger. Uh, and uh, bending and compression on one side uh, allows the bone to uh, stretch um, from the other side. So you literally don't want, again, the bones doesn't easily break. Uh, kind of think about a twig, if you're holding it uh, between your two fingers and you bend that twig, on one side it is compressing and on the outside of the um, twig it's stretching. If you can't imagine what I'm telling you, this is basically what we're talking about. So 
if you think about this as your femur right here the point of attach sorry the point of attachment for femur to the hip bone is the head of the femur which is basically where the body weight is located on so imagine you have a heavy weight on this bone what happens is this bone moves downward right the force moving the bone downward so this side of the bone the internal aspect of the bone is going to be compressed because you are pushing it down but this outer aspect of the bone is again is going to stretch right the force is going to be moving the bone outward and that's called the tension we'll talk about that in just a minute in more detail now when you think about this bending and compression on one side and a stretching on the other side why is this important so think about the structure of the bone i'm going to come back to this uh, if you look at the bone, and if I was looking at a longitudinal cut of this bone, uh, you will have compact bone on the edges of the bone, and you will have literally a cavity at the center of the bone, which is your medullary cavity. So the question is, how is the bone that weights and holds the weight of my body has a cavity at center, and it doesn't collapse on itself or break easily? Here's the reason. On the outer aspect of the bone, more uh, superficial aspect of it, uh, where you have the highest compression and tension, right? Uh, those are the points that are depicted with these arrows. So when you have the highest compression and the highest tension, uh, these areas are um, basically contain compact bone. Compact bone are pretty well structured, they have lamella, they're packed with uh, calcium and phosphate, which makes them really hard. And uh, they also have collagen fibers that provide the strength. And basically, again, making it less resistance to uh, compression forces and tension forces. Now, as you go farther in, the compression and tension forces are reduced. You can see the black arrows basically getting smaller and smaller. So by the time you get to the center of the bone, where you have your medullary cavity, literally the compression and tension are non-existence, and that is identified as point of no stress. Therefore, if there is no stress on the bone, you really don't need a compact bone to support that. Hence, you hollow that space uh, and create medullary cavity. Uh, that is where you store your yellow bone marrow. Now, another aspect of Wolf's Law, uh, it explains something that known as hardness of the bone. Uh, if you are right-handed or left-handed, uh, the bones that you are basically using more uh, or the side that you're using more has thicker and stronger bones um, in terms of your upper limbs. Uh, if you have the bones that are curved or the bones that are curved are typically thicker at the location where they are likely to buckle in terms of pressure so basically if there is a chance of having higher tension on parts of the bone at that part of the bone will have the thicker aspect making sure that the bone can be withstand the pressure um, I'm gonna skip the next one for turbiculate because uh, I didn't really discuss that with you guys previously. Um, next one, large bony projections occur when heavy uh, active muscles attach. Um, so if you look at uh, bones of, um, and compare these three categories, children or bedridden individuals, versus a normal individual that doesn't exercise uh, versus somebody who is lifting weights and is identified as let's say a bodybuilder so children and bedridden individuals uh, because there is no point of tension on their bone and their muscles are not actively engaged these individuals have really no specific structures on their bone so their bones identified as featureless. Now, if you have, if you're a normal individual, an adult, you would have um, bony projections, and these bony projections uh, will basically be points of attachment for the muscles. You have muscles, you have some levels of activities like typical walking, bending, so you will have some 
um, projections on the bone, but again, they're not going to be as pronounced. Now, if you are identified as somebody who is a weightlifter, they lift a significant amount of weight and their muscles are pretty large, then because those muscles need to have good points of attachment, uh, these individuals will have really bony projections and uh, that bony projections are basically help you attach muscles properly. So you can have different scenarios um, and different bone remodeling depending amount of distress you place on your bone. If you use your muscles a lot, muscles get bigger. So the points of attachments for those muscles also get uh, thicker. If you don't have as much activity, then uh, those bony projections are not as visible. And if you're bedridden or children, because you don't really put as much as stress on the bones or the stress is almost non-existent, uh, then the bones are identified as featureless with no thickening on a specific regions. Another aspect of this, again, is mechanical stress, which causes the remodeling of the bone. Uh, things that can cause the remodeling of the bone can be created as a result of electrical signals uh, when the bone is uh, um, basically required the remodeling. Um, Compression and stretch regions are oppositely charged, um, basically by the electrical signals. And uh, the changing in the fluid flow within the canaliculi of the bone also can uh, stimulate remodeling. So basically, you have two aspects. You have electrical signals that can target and affect the remodeling of the bone. And you also have the flow of the fluid within the canaliculi, or basically the channels that allow the cell to communicate uh, to also affect and stimulate remodeling. Uh, the other aspect of it is hormonal control. So releasing of the hormones can also cause or um, uh, affect the remodeling of the bone uh, in response to changes in terms of the calcium level in your blood. Um, however, however, do keep in mind that mechanical stress is determining where that remodeling is going to happen. Uh, if you don't have as much stress on a part of the bone, uh, then uh, your bone is probably not going to be remodeled in that region. However, if you have points of stress within your skeletal system, uh, then uh, those, are, those parts are going to be the part that are going to be the target of remodeling. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop here and we'll continue uh, in the next part, which is going to be relatively short for our last part of the skeletal system.